This video is brought to you by the Native Oak and has been sponsored by Wren. It would require a great philosopher and historian to explain the causes of the famous Seven Years' War in which Europe was engaged and in which Barry's regiment was now on its way to take part. If you're on YouTube and have an interest in 18th century military history, then I'm willing to bet that this intro is ingrained into your subconscious by now. For many of us, these redcoats marching resolutely into French musketry are among our first ever impressions of what linear combat must have looked and sounded like, usually before we even consider watching the actual film that it's from. Barry Lyndon is one of the great portrayals of the 18th century on the big screen, and one of the very few that I, and most of the reenactors that I know, can actually stomach. While it is not a military film, the titular characters, rather short-lived, service to king and country during the Seven Years' War is a major plot device. So at long last, after at least about four years of people asking for it, the time has finally come. In this video, we will talk about this iconic battle scene from Stanley Kubrick's Barry Lyndon. What's good about it, what's bad, and of course, we'll have a bit of pedantry thrown in as well. Oh yes, it may be uh, just under four minutes long, but there's an awful lot to say about this scene. Funnily enough, I think the greatest thing about this scene is what it isn't. All too often, historical films attempt to portray particular people in particular settings. Wellington at Waterloo, Bromhead at Rourke's Drift, and, I mean, I hate to include it in this trio, but Cornwallis at Camden, and etc, etc, etc. But this is a difficult thing to do, even for professional historians, let alone for filmmakers who are attempting to juggle the existing history with the entertainment value of their media. And the more specific you go, the trickier it is to get right, with uniform distinctions and troop positions, with what different battlefields looked like, and all of the other weeds that military history can get caught up in. All too often, this results in pieces that are either incredibly dull, which are artistically stunted, or just outright laughable in terms of accuracy, and unfortunately that tends to more often be the case. But with this scene, through one simple addition to the script, Barry Lyndon manages to not avoid, but at least sidestep a lot of those concerns. And it all comes in the opening narration, with one of those first few lines. Barry's first taste of battle was only a skirmish against a small rearguard of Frenchmen who occupied an orchard beside a road down which a few hours later the English main force would wish to pass. Though this encounter is not recorded in any history books, it was memorable enough for those who took part. This is a fictional event taking part in a non-fictional environment. This grants the filmmakers extraordinary amounts of freedom while still allowing them to set their story in reality. It gives them near total control over their narrative, which allows for much greater levels of accuracy regardless of the inevitable material shortcomings. Don't have tens of thousands of extras, including artillery batteries and horses, to showcase what a real army would have looked and acted like? Well, all right, use what you can, apply some camera tricks, and call it a skirmish. And can you only record on a very limited set? Well, that's okay. Make it a choke point that the army needs to force its way through. It helps to make history an asset to your story rather than a hindrance. Of course, this approach doesn't completely justify you doing whatever you want. You pull too many strings, and eventually the story just becomes fantasy. You can't just say, oh, and suddenly uh, the king appeared, and he gave a speech. Oh, and then, of course, he personally led a charge, and then elephants showed up. This isn't Lord of the Rings, it's history. I mean, both are amazing, but they oughtn't mesh together all too, too much. You'll always be beholden to certain ground rules, if you will, of the chosen time period, which requires extensive research to properly understand, and backing with primary sources and whatnot. And unfortunately, this scene does still neglect many of those rules, which ultimately hurt it an awful lot. But we'll come to all that later, for now we're trying to stay positive. Although now that I think about it, that, that actual language, the skirmish not appearing in any history books, I, what, what do you mean? Like, literally nobody wrote down 
literally anything about the engagement. It wasn't uh, recorded by any of the officers who were there in a diary, a general a letter. Uh, no orders were passed by. It didn't even appear in any sort of like regimental return. Like, oh yeah, by the way, we're going to battle today. Um, yeah, we lost a couple guys. And if there's a paper trail, it's probably going to be recorded somewhere. I mean, do you have any idea how many books there are about the Seven Years or how like um, shall we say, specifically invested people get into these sorts of topics, like how insanely niche it can... Anyways. Because this is an engagement without a name, without even an exact year in which it took part, when the film takes us to it, it does so with minimal context outside of the personal, that of Barry's perspective, which is what the film is really concerned with. And I really love it when films do this, because while so many history buffs will obsess themselves with the motions of armies across the tables and across the maps, uh, with the different little statistics of every gun, well, well this is a 5.5 millimeter, you're talking about the 5.6 millimeter, very big difference, none of that. What so many people tend to neglect is the personal element behind it all. Really, myself, I don't care much about what kinds of guns are being carried, is it a long line pattern or a short line pattern? It's important, but it's not what really gets me interested in history. I don't care so much about the guns that are being carried, so much as I do about the people who are carrying them. This introduction brilliantly says to the viewer, look, the political and military reality behind what you're about to see is complicated, and we don't have the time or the inclination to try and cover it all. And overall, this little skirmish is honestly not too important. Except, of course, for the men who fought and died in it. Because yes, while the events of such and such day on whatever field may not have been terribly consequential for the campaign of a certain year, for the guys on the ground, it would have been immensely consequential. It would have been life and death. And the cinematography also captures this sentiment just amazingly well. Although I could certainly see the silliness in someone like myself pointing out that uh, Stanley Kubrick knew his stuff when it comes to making movies. Where so many films will begin their battle scenes with wide-ranging shots of vast armies forming up on the field, Barry Lyndon does the exact opposite. The shot begins close up, focused on the individual. Its emphasis isn't on the army so much as it is on Barry and his personal experience, which is what the film is talking about here. That's the reason for all this happening. It's how it affects Barry. Not the nation, not the army, not the war. It's all about Barry. And as the camera pulls out, we see Barry's wider context, that he is merely one part of a much wider body. And it isn't the smooth pan either, but a bumpy step, as if we ourselves are marching with the army. Nearly every camera angle in this scene emphasizes exactly the same personal elements. Using low angles, tight fields of view, doesn't only make this small field of extras feel like a much larger and more imposing force, it also helps to place the viewer in the shoes of the soldiers. We aren't some overhead spectator lording over the battlefield like a god, we're right down there with the men, staring down the muzzles. The sound design really helps with all of this as well. The you know the, the, the pounding of the drums and, and the heavy footfalls with every pace, the um, the clacking of, of, of accouterments and belting and, and bayonets against the muzzles, um, and the blaring of fifes and everything. It's a it's a beautifully strong contrast, the the pomp and the circumstance alongside the apprehension, the, the madness that is war. And from our perspective, with these really long, singular shots, we feel every bit of that tension, that apprehension, as well. Of course, the sound design is also the source of a lot of the scene's problems when it comes to historical accuracy, and a great example of where reality very much acts contrary to, in this case, Kubrick's artistic vision. But again, hard as it is for me, we are trying to stay positive right now, and we'll talk about all that later. There's also the fact that, much like the entirety of Barry Lyndon, when you look at the scene as a whole, and neglecting those niggling little details that always will drive people like me up a wall, 
it looks just stunning, just beautiful. I mean, it looks like a painting, this long line of real red-coated men instead of CGI effects. And the fact that most of them are more or less in step really helps too, uh, which in the long run actually may even be more accurate than having everyone in absolute perfect step like you might get, you know, with CGI effects, that level of perfection. That's just a little unrealistic. I mean, we're talking about a battle here, not some clean parade ground. And the colors! Oh, they're beautiful! There's actually two of them! Every regiment of the British Army would have had two flags that represented that specific regiment on the battlefield. Sort of like a way for them to signal to other regiments and commanding officers who they were, and to provide a rallying point for the men should one be required. One of those flags, or colors as they were called, was the regimental colors, and the other was the king's colors. The former could come in a wide variety of different colors and designs, all depending on the regiment that's carrying them, while the latter would be a Union flag, often with the regimental badge of some sort in its center. And finally, another one of the better elements of this scene are the deaths. No way I can really say that without it sounding really creepy, I know. They aren't perfect, mind, but look at how most of these men react when they're hit. They don't fly backwards like they were smacked by a truck, but there is a very clearly powerful punch into these bodies. They grip at the point of impact, their faces are pained, and they fall more or less straight down. Nothing is overacted, there's no hokey dramatic music, and as the men fall, they're replaced by the rear rank, and the march carries on. Uh, particularly this shot here from just behind the French line, where we see the Brits fall as they come onwards like some unstoppable machine. It, it's really interesting and a perspective that we don't often see. Of course, that's also because the French are clearly not using actual black powder flintlock muskets, and as such, there's nowhere near enough smoke as a result, but no, we're, we're, we're going to talk about that later. And as the formation carries on, one of its officers is hit, and Barry breaks ranks to catch him, although that's definitely a no-no unless he was ordered to do so by the officer himself or another superior. But they're friends, you know how it goes. It's at this point, as the formation passes them by like a great wave, that we see the result of the French fire. Dozens of bodies litter the ground, the dead and the dying writhing about, attempting to crawl to fallen comrades and safety. And as the British line finally reaches the charge, we don't get to witness the action. Instead, we are dragged backwards to witness its results. Men abandoned to die alone in the mud. They were promised glory, distinguishment, a bounty in futures as gentlemen. This is what they received. It should come as no surprise that cinematographically, there's a word for you, uh, this is a beautiful scene and an extraordinary achievement. Like most of its source material, the scene evokes the 18th century like a piece of artwork and takes very clear inspiration from a number of paintings about the Seven Years' War, both uh, contemporary to it and created after the fact, Victorian pieces and whatnot. At once, the scene is emphasizing the beauty, the glory, the splendor of the military alongside the terror and the tragedy of its art being warfare. It isn't being overly critical in a way to make us roll our eyes or anything, but instead is presenting that dual reality pretty well, I'd say. And perhaps most importantly to us from an historical standpoint, the scene is justifying its existence to the viewer by explaining that it is a more generalized environment. It's devoid of too many specific concerns, uh, so that our attention is directed precisely where the filmmaker wants it to be. And not on the war, or on the battle, not even on the regiment, all of which are purely incidental, but on the experience of the individual, that of Redmond Barry. Oh, but unfortunately, this scene is far, far from perfect, and the closer you look at it, its mechanics and those niggling little military details, the more rapidly and utterly it begins to fall apart. For example, dear, oh dear, is it clean, far too clean. And no, don't worry, Chris, I'm not talking about the soldiers or their personal hygiene, their clothing or anything. Um, in fact, all of that is, is well taken care of, well maintained, and worthy of their soldierly air. For, for uh, 
more context on what I mean by all of this, check out Chris's video about the uh, about about the whole you know why reenactors are too clean uh, thing it isn't anywhere near as much of a problem as people you know often make it out to be. What I mean is that the battle itself, you could say, is too clean. As much as I love the hits that the men take here, when they do go down, they're doing so silently. And when they grasp at their wounds, as good as that is to show, it's also painfully obvious that there really isn't anything there, with the notable exception, of course, of Barry's friend. But even in that instance, we see little beyond the appearance of a perfectly round hole in his waistcoat. Even if it is intentionally vague to serve a greater plot purpose, the scene is still attempting to portray warfare, a battle, organized mass killing. And yet no naughty words are spoken, nor a spot of blood shown. It might meet the requirements of certain Tennessee school boards, a hey, topical, uh, and I know that it all serves a narrative function for the film, but for our purposes today, it is far from historical accuracy. It is not an accurate portrayal of war. Musket balls are awful things. Unlike modern bullets, which will efficiently, well, more somewhat, like relatively speaking efficiently, uh, cut into their targets with these conical tips and the spin and all that. I'm not a ballistics expert, but you know, they, they sort of cut their way into their target much more efficiently compared with a musket ball, which is very, very round, very soft, and usually around 60 to 75 caliber in size for military use. They don't cut into their targets, they punch into their targets and immediately begin to deform and potentially even splinter into multiple parts. They will bounce around, well not really like around dramatically, but you know they'll hit one and they'll angle up. They will bounce within bodies and they could very well, you know, not very pleasantly, but they could break out of the other side. And when they do, while the entry wound may be, again, relatively clean, the exit wounds are horrendous. Now, I don't mean to harp on this because it could very well be a topic all its own, but suffice to say that when you have a veritable wall of these things tearing headlong into rows of men, it isn't going to be pretty and it isn't going to be quiet. So while Barry Lyndon does much better than most media at showing the sadness, the, the tragedy and the contradictions of warfare, it does not even begin to capture that which might be a more poignant message, being just how grotesque it all must have been. But if you could somehow combine the more genuinely disgusting elements of war, the likes of which you see in many more modern day sorts of films, especially war films, uh, with all of the positive things that I mentioned earlier about this scene, then I dare say that you would have a, a, an amazing, a great portrayal of just how chaotic and just genuinely horrifying linear warfare was. Unfortunately, the cleanliness here does make it fall apart a bit. Another important element that makes this overall portrayal of warfare far too simple, neat, and polite, or, or perhaps we should say gentlemanly, would be how quiet it is. I already commented that the sound design here is incredible, but really that's only half true. For that which is actually present, yes, it is incredible, the, the drums and the accoutrements, uh, you know, slapping against one another, things like that, absolutely. But unfortunately, there's also an awful lot missing here. Let me explain. As a force advances, yes, you should be hearing the drums pounding step above all else, but you should also be hearing all sorts of cries and commands from corporals and sergeants for the men to mind their dressing, which basically means to mind the amount of spacing between each of them, and from officers uh, issuing commands based on how the situation in front of them is changing, to march obliquely to the left or right, to hasten or slow their pace if the lines begin to bend, all sorts of other things. I mean, it's already difficult enough to get a massive line like this to keep together, even in perfect conditions, to say nothing of when the guns start going off. And then you have to have orders to fill gaps in the line, and of course that combination of threats and encouragement that come with getting the men to keep advancing into gunfire like this. So while the film wants us to look at this and think, wow, what stoic professionals, uh, those who know a bit more about the time period might just be thinking to themselves, sheesh, why is anyone doing their job? 
Now, another big thing people will mention with regards to this scene is how the French musketry is way too fast, that they're firing volleys far too quickly, and this is resulting in more casualties for the British than would have been realistic. Now, the question of casualty ratios and proportion of, of hits to rounds fired uh, is something that'd be really interesting to get into, uh, but I haven't done any research on it for this video in particular, and it, it's better to save it for its own video in future. Uh, I'll save that as a topic later on. Don't worry, it, it'll be on the video list. But let's get to that rate of fire, because it's actually not as bad as you may think. I went through and counted every time the French fire in this scene, uh, including the ones off camera that are only discernible through audio. And I found that the French formation fires a total of seven times in 53 seconds. That's one volley roughly every 7.6 seconds. Now, obviously, that is way too quick for any individual soldier to be firing. A parade standard was closer to around every 15 to 20 seconds, while in a battle, at least when the enemy's shooting back at you, it might sink down to 30 seconds or even longer if you're still engaging in volley firing. But when you divide the force up into, say, three different sections, it becomes pretty easy to get those figures. This is something I discussed in my last video, how 18th century armies shot each other, in its second part, firing by sections, which I'll be sure to link below if you'd like to get more specific info here. But if you have three sections, assuming each section is loading and firing in good time, it wouldn't be too unreasonable to get somewhere around that same figure. The problem, however, comes not in how quickly the men are firing, but with the technique that they are using to start with. In that same previous video, I discussed firing by ranks and how it honestly doesn't strike me as being terribly useful. In fact, in the video, I even argue that it is objectively worse than firing by sections in most generalized circumstances. I also asked if anyone had any primary sources that supported its being used, and a few examples did come to light that I had never heard of, um, so thank you to those who brought them forward. However, it does seem like the majority of its use, whenever it did happen, was really very limited. It was something of like an anti-cavalry technique in like very super specific years in the 18th century. Um, one very good comment was going through uh, French doctrine throughout like a large portion of the 18th century saying, well, in like these three years it was allowed, these next three years it was outlawed, and then it was used in this campaign, but then it wasn't in that one very, very specific applications. And for all the reasons that I detailed in that previous video, it's not the sort of thing that you want to be doing against a large block of approaching infantry when there is practically no risk of cavalry. I mean, they are fighting along a very narrow, well, relatively narrow front, and they can see the enemy in front of them very, very cleanly. Um, instead, I'd recommend firing by platoons to maintain a consistent and rapid fire along the entire front. But guess what the French are doing in the scene? That's right, they're firing by ranks. And in doing so, realistically, they'd be unnecessarily slowing down their rate of fire and reducing their own accuracy against an absolutely massive block of infantry that is getting very, very close to them. But hold on, how would firing by ranks be reducing their accuracy? Well, if they were using proper black powder fire locks, then with every round fired, every musket would be spewing forth great clouds of white smoke, both from its muzzle and from the touch hole at its base. A well-timed volley, and I speak from personal experience here, can very much obscure a formation's vision for some time. Now, admittedly, it is a very windy day here, which helps to clear off that smoke. We can see that evidenced by the violent waving of the colors. But all the same, look at the direction of that wind. Any large smoke plumes would be moving towards the British, not out of French sight. But I don't believe that they are even firing the appropriate kinds of guns here, uh, because instead what we do see are these incredibly faint, thin little puffs which exhale only from the muzzle of the firearms. I'm not entirely sure what these men are firing, but it's definitely not a full charge of 18th century black powder. By their sound, these actually sound like caplock muskets to me. Uh, you can tell because they're much more of a sharp and high-pitched firing sound, rather than the uh, sizzling, thwomping boom of the flintlock. Although, interestingly, if you zoom in on this fellow here to the far left, he is actually carrying a flintlock. It's just not primed and cocked, so it can't actually shoot anything. 
Uh, you can see a few of the men in this frame here with the same situation going on. So I can't say for certain but it looks to me like there are two possibilities here. One, either the men whose guns we can actually see just aren't shooting, and then the rest of them do have cap locks with sl very slight powder charges, or possibly that these sound effects were added in in post, and they're not really shooting anything at all. But above all else, what I do know for certain, again, is that these men are definitely not firing a line of flintlock muskets. Similarly, we never see any of the French actually reloading. Uh, conveniently, the camera is off of them every time they would have to do so, and uh, a little editing error here, uh, we actually see the same rear rank uh, firing repeatedly. They're the, the, some of the only ones we ever see firing for most of the shots, even though the timing between each volley definitely wouldn't have given them enough time to do so. I suppose this is because the uh, camera angle behind them was the easiest to get to with the men being in such close order, and of course because it looks very dramatic, very, very... Um, iconic and kind of frightening. Uh, but another key element as to why firing by ranks is less efficient in this scenario than, say, firing by platoons is that reloading process and how complicated it gets with multiple ranks all doing the same thing at the same time. When the camera doesn't show us that, we kind of lose that element of why it wouldn't work, which, I mean, from the filmmaker pr pr perspective, it makes sense, but from the historical perspective, you know, Proof is in the pudding? That's the expression? I don't know. You get what my point is. Moving on. When it comes to understanding why the men wouldn't want to fire by ranks in this circumstance, and why aiming can be so difficult in a sustained firefight, alongside all sorts of other details on why the armies are fighting in this way to start with, well, these sorts of seemingly small details are really very important, because it's the culmination of these niggling little details that ultimately are creating the environments in which these historical figures are operating. This is the context that makes everything else make sense. It is the building blocks of the historical setting. And when you remove those core material conditions, the genuine logic of the time period, well, it starts to collapse under its own weight. When you watch Barry Lyndon, things like how overall peaceful and, and almost genteel this scene feels make an awful lot more sense, because it serves as a harsh contrast to the later, more personal, more intimate struggles of the protagonist. Like I said before, from a filmmaker's perspective, this is a beautiful scene, and a one that doesn't shy away from demonstrating the contradictions, so to say, of military life. However, on a more independent basis, taking it on its own merits, as a representation of historical warfare, it falls very, very short of being historically accurate. And unfortunately, it is in that vacuum that I know many individuals first witnessed this scene, where, devoid of the film's context, its flaws become much more obvious. By neglecting so many of the key material elements of linear warfare, and particularly its chaotic nature, we do not get a portrayal which leaves us with a better understanding of why they are fighting this way. Instead, it just makes it all look very strange, very alien, very silly, and very poorly planned. To be sure, my opinion of the actual scene dramatically increased after I watched the entire Barry Lyndon film. You know, sort of like realizing when you watch the whole thing, like, that's why it was so calm and quiet and like genteel when compared with other things later on. Like it, it, it matches well, it jives with the rest of the movie, but when you're only watching the one scene, you don't get that, if that makes any sense. Goodness, she's beautiful, but she probably doesn't even know that I'm completely offsetting my carbon footprint with ren.co slash start slash brands and app. Would that I could find a real man who was making a simple yet effective difference in the world and the climate crisis. It was simple enough. All I had to do was use their website to calculate my personal carbon footprint and then offset it by funding a diverse mixture of carbon reduction projects and products. I know. Perhaps I could use some of the regular monthly updates that Ren sends me, complete with reports and photographs on how my contributions are being used to fight climate change. I need to step outside for a moment. It's incredibly stuffy in here, and our warming planet isn't doing me any favors in all this makeup, powder, and petticoats. Now's my chance. Huh. <sighs> Would that there was some convenient and efficient way for me to help make a difference. Have you heard of mineral weathering? 
It's a novel new form of climate research up in Scotland. It involves reforesting vast swaths of previously neglected plots of land, and then adding crushed basalt into its soil to speeden up the Earth's natural carbon cycle, sequestering the carbon for millions of years, and improving our biodiversity all at once. It's just one of the many projects I've been supporting lately, with my subscription to ren.co slash start slash Brandon F. Did you say... Ren? Dot co slash start slash Brandon F. Yes. To make a long story short, six hours after they had met, her ladyship had signed up for Ren by using the link in the description below. And as she was among the first 100 to do so, 10 extra trees were planted in her name. She later thanked Ren for sponsoring this video. And of course, no film review would be complete without our grossly unnecessary targeting of all those little pedantic details. Although, there might be more of a point than we realize. We'll come to that later on. In any case, I can't cover everything here, of course, uh, not only because of time constraints, uh, but because Seven Years War uh, uniforms and drill really aren't my thing. I'm more of a um, 1764 onwards kind of guy. Um, but really, there's still some things that I can pick up on. Um, and then I was able to get some extra info regarding Seven Years War drill from my friend Colton as well. Everyone say hi. Hi, hi Colton. Hi. Say hi. So, the uniforms. Well, the further away you get from them, the better they look. But unfortunately, once you get in nice and close, well, oh dear, something tells me that those facings are not made of broadcloth. Like, the entire coat isn't made of the appropriate material. Broadcloth is a very thick, heavy, and durable material that resists fraying and is relatively, relatively easy to clean. It's the kind of wool that most British Army uniforms were made of during this time period. If you'd like to see an example of the stuff and how it compares to other lesser materials, uh, you can see it in the Far Off Stations video titled The Evolution of British Red Reenacting Redcoat, sort of like a history of reenacting and how, like, at least in his own unit, the quality of the material culture has changed. Things like that. I'll link it down below. Good example of broadcloth, though. But the this stuff, as you can see, is clearly very flimsy, probably wouldn't stand up to very harsh campaigning for all too long. And the French aren't faring much better either, I'm afraid. Just look at the wrinkles on their shoulders and how the fabric is bunching up under their belts there. The men on both sides are also not wearing their hats correctly. Uh, while one of many civilian fashions may be to wear one's cocked hat, what we today call tricorns, uh, straight on, military fashion would dictate that the hat be askew on one's head, and there are dozens of different sources, both written and in artwork, to support this. Alongside people thinking it looked good, it also served a practical function to wear one's hat this way, uh, primarily in preventing the soldier from knocking his own hat off when he shoulders his musket. My friend Chris has a video on exactly that topic, and I also mentioned it in a much older video of my own if you'd like to learn more about cocked hats. Moving on with the soldiers' uniforms, though, none of them seem to have any lacing either. Usually around the soldiers' buttons on their facings and cuffs, there'd be a pattern of lace which would vary from regiment to regiment. Alongside things like the color of the soldiers' facings and the pattern on their buttons, this was one of the identifying factors for which regiment a soldier belonged to, but these coats seem very generic to say the least. And one last uniform concern, you can see here that all of the British officers seem to be wearing very tall riding boots. It's a great look, but unfortunately it's less than accurate. Unless an officer is, well, actually mounted, uh, far more often than not they would not be wearing riding boots, but shoes with gaiters, much like the rest of the men. Riding boots are especially overrepresented in reenactment events, uh, where it seems like many of the officers will be wearing them without any horses in sight. Now we come to my favorite part, let's talk drill. If this scene was taking part just a few short years in the future, then it would be a lot better with these bayonets. But unfortunately, the practice of holding them so low down on the chest like this is actually from the 1764 manual exercise, which was implemented, as the name would indicate, after the Seven Years' War ended in the 1750s. Before that, I believe the men would be using a version of Bland's military treatise, although if I'm wrong on that, I'll be sure to leave a comment down below specifying such. Um, but if you'd like to read the original language, which, dear lord, is it complicated, uh, of the treatise, then I, I will post it um, in, on my website, nativeoak.org, for you to, uh, to look through. 
But in Bland's, this is how the men would be charging their bayonets, held high up on the body, with the right hand on the butt plate, the left bent inwards, either on the swell or with the swell in the elbow. Certainly good for a really heavy punch forward, but not very comfortable looking, and very, very far from the 1764 manual exercises version of things. Of course, even if these men were meant to be using the 64 drill, they wouldn't be doing a terribly good job. I mean, look at this. The bayonets are being kept at all sorts of different levels. Some are parallel to the ground, while others are sticking way up. And the placement of the men's hands is all over the place, too. Whereas the right hand ought to be kept down and around waist height, just behind the trigger, with the left hand at the swell of the musket, and holding it slightly upwards and level with all the other bayonets in the line. See, here's an excellent opportunity for an NCO to start calling out for the men to mind the dressing on their bayonets, to make sure that they're all being held in a proper position for countering any blows that are soon to come their way. But a lot of these men are definitely not ready for fencing, and the NCOs are certainly not doing their jobs. The men in the rear ranks here are also at the shoulder, whereas they probably ought to be at the recover. That way, if the front rank man falls, uh, then they can just step right up with their muskets already in a much easier position to move into the charge. Uh, I'm not familiar with the pre-1764 drill, uh, but going from one to the other in that system is pretty easy, whereas going from the shoulder requires a bit more movement, um, and I imagine it's going to be much the same for earlier systems systems as well. And the last thing I'll talk about today is the spacing here, which is way too far apart between these ranks. And yes, yes, I know the excuse, it helps to make it look like there's more extras on the camera, but no, it's unnecessary and it makes it look silly to anyone who knows the difference. Regardless of whether your men are in open or closed order, you want to make sure that the spacing between each rank is nice and tight. That way they can easily identify and replace their file partner should that person fall rather than having to run forward six paces just to catch up, and they can keep the lines well-dressed far more easily. The other big reason you want to keep close order is to prove a stronger formation in case cavalry comes against you, although obviously that isn't as much of a concern here. Wider spacing also makes them a wider target for artillery, and makes the overall organization far less wieldy in the wheelings, uh, going from line into column, and all sorts of other kinds of marching. Maybe I should make a video about the different kinds of maneuvering as well in the... okay. From the perspective of a filmmaker, this is just about the perfect scene. It plays wonderfully into the overall path of the film, pres evoking precisely the sorts of emotions which it sets out to do, uh, in a way that can truly only be understood and appreciated when it's being viewed within the wider context, within the film as a whole. Historically, however, it is far from perfect, and as is unfortunately often the case, the closer you look into it, the more glaring errors you will find. Personally, I think that if you know about how linear warfare was generally fought, these little errors may be glaring to you, as they were to me, but they might also be conveniently ignored in favor of what the scene does well. That beautiful cinematography, the artwork-like imagery, the metaphors that play through it all, things like that. But to those who start off thinking that soldiers were only fighting in lines out of ignorance or arrogance or some strange concept of chivalry and glory because things were so much fancier back in the day, anything like that, well then, I'm afraid that this scene will do nothing uh, to help grant a further or better understanding about the time period and indeed might actually aid in reinforcing those negative ideas. So overall, I'd say it's a pretty mixed bag, as is honestly the entirety of Barry Lyndon. It's still one of my favorites and in certain ways can really evoke the time period incredibly well. But in others, it still falls prey to modern misconceptions and historical inaccuracies. As always, if anything ever surprises or confuses you with historical films, or, or even just seems a little strange, a little off, or, or even just seems new to you, well then, make sure to confirm it with recent secondary scholarship, and of course, plenty of primary sources. This video was created in support of the Native Oaks educational mission and was made possible by the generosity of our membership. You can learn more about that mission, visit our digital library, and shop for merchandise all at nativeoak.org.
And hey, I've uh, finally moved into my new apartment, so that means new set. Um, th this is very much temporary. I plan on occupying the desk with all sorts of fun little things for you all to see. And obviously, well, this is just a piece of merchandise for me. You can find that on hey, nativeoak.org if you want to buy this or smaller version of it in a poster. Um, but this is temporary. Um, if anyone happens to have any ideas as far as what could be added here, then uh, let me know. Thank you all so very much for watching. And until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.